thanks for coming, everyone. Um, if you have been in this room for the last session, like thanks for sticking out uh, some more queer themed research. And if you're new, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, if, whether you're interested in this topic or just because it's the last presentation, I thank you anyway. Um, my name is Tom, and I studied film and television. Um, and growing up queer in a suburban area um, with no real role models or references for my experiences, um, I scoured movies and TV for answers, some sort of validation or just some sort of hint that I was normal. And as I grew older and more comfortable with myself, I became less comfortable with what I was seeing on screen. Queer representation on television specifically is increasing, but the diversity of that representation seems to not be increasing at the same rate. So fast forward to college, we're gonna fade in here. Let's say that's me representation. <laughs> um, and I integrated myself very quickly at BU into a community of queer folks from a variety of backgrounds and identities. And I found that two things happened. Maybe more than two. At the risk of sounding a little bit didactic, I'm gonna go through these flags and say what they mean. We have, of course, uh, the gay flag, gay pride flag bisexuality, the attraction to men and women, pansexuality, the attraction to folks regardless of gender or bisexuality, uh, but more inclusive of non-binary and transgender identities, asexuality, the lack of experiencing sexual attraction or under specific circumstances only. In the second row, the transgender flag, gender fluid, um, which falls under the trans umbrella, those who identify with different gender identities at different moments or experience a fluidity in their identification. Um, a gender, <laughs> um, or yes, sorry, gender fluid and gender queer. Slight difference, gender queer, um, a non-binary person being that you exist outside the gender binary um, and either refuse to identify um, or identify with a non-binary gender. And then a gender, um, again, similar to asexuality, not identifying at all with a specific gender identity. And so I realized as I encountered all of these folks, and this is only a fraction of the identities um, that I encountered and that I celebrated in coming to Boston University, um, I realized that we shared the same frustrations about our on-screen representations of our experiences, that being that they were really hard to come by or incredibly limited. Cut to some facts to back this up. It, as sad as the statistics are, it was very validating uh, to see our frustrations uh, confirmed. So every, every year, uh, GLAD, uh, Gays and Lesbians Allied Against Defamation, uh, publishes a comprehensive study of queer representation on television. Um, and so here is a brief breakdown of the Where We Are on TV report for the 2016-2017 television season. As you can see here, uh, this is diversity of regular characters on primetime scripted uh, television. Uh, an overwhelming 95.4% are straight or not queer. Um, and only 4.8, which is 43 characters in this slice of television um, are LGBTQ or queer. Breaking that down a little further, um, <laughs> the breakdown of the umbrella term queer into more specific queer identities, we can see uh, that on, on both broadcast and cable, um, gay men overwhelmingly dominate similar uh, domination of lesbian representation on streaming services with gay men coming in a close second, leaving uh, all other queer representations largely by the wayside. Even more disturbing is the racial and ethnic diversity of those queer representations. It is so incredibly whitewashed on all three of these major platforms to clarify the streaming services, that's your Netflix and your Hulu and your Amazon Prime. So this representation is overwhelmingly white. And more generally, just like exploding these data outside of queer representation as well. This reflects broadcast numbers. GLAD is also interested in gender representation. And so even though the population is roughly 51% female, only 44%, which is a slight increase from last year, of characters on broadcast are female, queer or otherwise. So motivated by these data and my personal frustrations and those that I shared with my peers, I sought to develop an original television series that explores issues specific to queer youth experiences and better represents the diversity of those experiences of those youth in the United States today. 
my approach to this, I started with some academic research. Um, I had encountered some queer theory in television and film coursework before, but I wanted to take a deeper dive into this field. And so in as many uh, formal studies as personal essays, uh, queer television scholars have insisted on the importance of queer youth representation um, on screen for identity formation and validation, but also for education um, of queer and non-queer youth audiences alike about the different experiences that youth have. And scholars have also lamented the difficulty of achieving that representation. Um, traditionally, TV shows have existed as vehicles for advertising on your broadcast and cable channels. Um, so if programming can't attract the favor of advertisers, or rather the markets that they're willing to advertise to, a program will either not be successful or not be aired. So unfortunately, even though there are some really benevolent people in the industry who are trying to break down these barriers of representation of queer youth, um, money often speaks louder than they do. My favorite part of my research was speaking with local queer youth, both here in Boston and where I'm from in Southern Maine, uh, informally about their experiences growing up as a queer person watching TV, how they grappled with their representations on screen or lack thereof, and more generally about their experiences growing up as a queer youth. And I asked them what things from their own lives would they think would be helpful for people like them who are perhaps younger to see. And these are some of the major themes that I took away as I was compiling my pages and pages of notes, uh, these great um, dialogues that I have with these folks. They wanted us to get closer to narrative gender equality. By that I mean, um, allowing female characters to have storylines that are not just quote unquote female specific issues. Additionally, a greater representation of non-binary and gender non-conforming characters on television. Now, transgender representation, especially trans youth, is not nearly where it should be, but specifically those uh, who are non-binary, meaning those who uh, do not um, like socially or medically transition from one end of the binary to the other in terms of their gender presentation, um, are even less represented on TV. And in the words of one of my participants, it's the next big step in queer youth representation. Um, youth would like to see a greater mix of incidental and explicit queerness in television narratives. Incidental meaning it's not a big deal. A character that is queer just is queer, and it's not problematized in the narrative. But additionally, it's important to showcase how one's queerness explicitly can affect their experience and can be integral to the plot of some of these characters and how they move through narratives. Additionally, and this was perhaps the most fascinating to me, youth were really good at identifying two other things that I didn't necessarily expect them to be able to articulate. Um, a lot of these were, they were ages 13 to 24, but most of them skewed on the young side. They wanted stories that gave them the inclusive sex education that they didn't get in public school. Um, stories about sex that's not just penetrative sex between a man and a woman and how that can happen safely. Additionally, stories that highlight the importance and significance of the internet as a tool for community building um, for these youth specifically and also as a tool for education as well. So with all of this, I developed a show and wrote a pilot and a detailed outline for a 10 episode season. And it's called Outskirts, in which the fight to create a genders and sexualities alliance, or GSA, at a suburban New England high school threatens the status quo and inspires students to find belonging in some unlikely places. And so I broke down using GLAD's metrics what my characters reflected in terms of diversity um, but I don't want to reduce these characters to the statistics based on their identities that you can see here. Um, their stories range from sorrow to triumph and all the everyday mumbo jumbo in between. Um, and I would be super, super jazzed to talk about them with anyone who'd be interested, um, whether you want to use some Q&A time uh, for that or talk to me after. It's an ensemble of 12. Um, and they've come to mean a lot to me. Um, not just because I feel very strongly that each of them is a small piece of me, but they're equally informed by um, these other folks that came with me together and came out in the name of good storytelling, um, and because we exist. So thank you. I will now open it up for questions. Yes. Oh goodness! Oh, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, 
So, hmm, oh, it's, it's difficult to choose. Um, sure, yeah, actually, so the, the one who emerges in the pilot as um, the protagonist, if I had to choose one in the whole series, um, her name is Kit. Um, she is a second generation um, Korean young woman. She is queer um, and she is motivated to start the GSA at her high school uh, when her Tumblr blog, um, which is full of um, very progressive feminist, queer feminist content, uh, it, it serves for her as a resource uh, to engage with that discourse as a young person and learn more about her experiences and just feel less alone. Um, when she finds that other people are noticing what she's doing and are starting to reach out to her for advice, she realizes that though she's very well read, she doesn't have any practical experience in trying to affect positive change in her community. So she, um, in deciding to start this group at school, um, she struggles to translate her confidence online to real world confidence and has to overcome some very real social anxiety. Um, but in, in the long term, she does, and she becomes a very influential, visible voice in the community. So I'm a big fan of Kit. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, so in your research and in your project, uh, on the issue of like representation, were you able to establish either like motives or explanations why uh, cable providers had underrepresentation? Was it a conscious like underrepresentation, or were they unaware of like the proportions of people and their identities? Mm -hmm. um, the answer uh, is it's both. Um, in some cases, um, it is simply a reflection of a lack of queer representation in writers' rooms and at cable networks where these projects are being developed um, and then carried out from pre-production to delivery and showing it on TV. Um, but in other cases, um, it is a very conscious act to either um, really censor some more explicit queer narratives, explicit not necessarily sexually, but just in um, its overtness um, and recognition of queer related issues. Um, either um, someone, let's say for example, um, who's writing an episode that has some queer content, whether or not that author is queer, um, they, there are some case studies that I read about pressure either from above or self-imposed pressure to censor or just kind of desensitize the subject matter, um, especially actually in the cases of uh, queer screenwriters because they feel the burden of representation. I need to have a quote unquote positive representation of this community, especially since um, largely on cable specifically and also on broadcast to some extent, um, any episode of a TV show that deals with queer content is more likely than not gonna be a, a single episode story. Queer characters often do not have the privilege of being recurring, let alone main characters. So the burden is extra high in those cases. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about, um, in terms of the statistics within representation of LGBTQ people, mm -hmm. um, what you saw in terms of age demographics. So we have this sort of prototype of the old gay man, right? Or right. That kind of thing. And I wonder if there's any explanation for that, or is part of the, the issue here that representing young uh, gay people, for example, is seen as more problematic than old ones? How, how, so how does the age gap? Mm. Yeah, so th I didn't see as many data about that. Like that's not one of GLAD's metrics. Um, there, There's other data too, but that's not something I um, dove too far into because I knew that my target demographic was youth specifically. Um, however, what I've gleaned from what I have read um, is that the simple answer is that queer youth narratives, uh, though they are in the grand scheme of things not super likely to happen, are more likely to happen um, than queer narratives focusing on older characters um, because it's sexier, edgier. Um, there's a very um, multi-layered issue um, in how <laughs> this is, uh, there, there's this term homo-nationalism, um, which was coined by um, a scholar, Jasbir Puar, um, who uh, studies gender and ethnic studies, and she coined the term um, in a, a book she wrote talking about um, how some countries use um, acceptance of gay people specifically is essentially a PR stunt to um, 
give the perception that they are really strong in their sovereignty um, and their liberal politics to attract tourists and also really residents of the country. And uh, some scholars have mapped that idea onto TV, um, basically saying like if you can make gayness marketable, it can happen. Um, and since um, you know the economics of television. Um, privileged content that's directed towards uh, more affluent, socially privileged markets. It's this perfect storm where representations of the white gay man are going to happen a lot more often than anything else. All right, that's all the time we have, but thank you all so much.